welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Susan Donarski. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and also at the School of Education in the Department of Economics. And I'm co-founder with Brian Jacob of the Education um, Policy Initiative. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. This is our first epi talk of the season. Uh, and it's great to see this wonderful turnout. Um, uh, EPI is a program of coordinated activities um, uh, to apply rigorous uh, um, research methodology to the evaluation of education policy. Uh, we sponsor speakers like this. We work to disseminate best practices to practitioners. Um, uh, we train graduate students. We've got postdocs. We have all sorts of fun. Um, uh, so thanks for being here for the first event of our season. Um, today we're pleased to present uh, Sean Reardon a distinguished, yeah, that's, I'm just reading what I, what I <laughs> a distinguished, uh, my mom would agree, yeah, <laughs> professor of education and sociology at Stanford University and director of the Stanford Interdisciplinary Training Program in Quantitative Education Policy Analysis. Sean's done important work uh, in a variety of, of areas of education research, including the effects of education policy on educational and social inequality, causes, patterns, trends, and consequences of social and educational inequality, and applied statistical methods for education research. Most recently, he's written about the widening achievement gap between children from high and low income families and the growth in residential segregation between high and low income families over the past 40 years. So a really interesting set of, of, of research topics. Today, Sean's going to discuss his research examining the relationship between income and income inequality uh, with educational uh, outcomes. Uh, his, he's going to talk for uh, about an hour, uh, and then we're going to have Q&A. Um, so if you can hold questions till the end, um, that'd, be, um, that'd be terrific. Uh, so let me thank uh, um, the Gessner Fund, the Charles H. and Susan Gessner Fund, the Institute for Education Sciences, and Rackham uh, for their support of this event. Um, uh, and anyone here who's in my stats class will recognize what I'm going to say next, which is, if at all possible, if you can break yourself free, Close your electronics so we can focus on the on the speaker. I know whenever I'm giving a talk and I see people on a computer, she's transcribing, so she gets to. But I assume people are che checking Facebook or, or, or surfing porn or something, and uh, you don't want him to worry about that. Okay. Thank you. Now I have that image in my head. What image exactly, Sean? So, you know, they always tell you when you speak to people, you know, imagine the audience naked and it makes you less nervous. But now I'm not imagining that. You know, I'm imagining, anyway. So, um, anyway, thank you, Sue, for uh, the invitation and the, and the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a sort of a, a body of work, a couple studies that I've been doing with some colleagues over the last few years that are all sort of uh, around the sort of issues of understanding the relationship between family income, income inequality at a kind of a, 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 you know, a national or a contextual sort of level, and how well children do in school, uh, how, how they do on achievement tests, how, how far they uh, go in school, um, and things like that. All sort of um, to help think about a sort of big set of questions that are of interest both to sort of people who study education, sociologists of education, economists of education, but also sort of just from a sort of broad uh, social perspective, because I think they illuminate um, or help us at least think about some of the issues uh, of, of the current era. So, you know, one of the best well-known sort of stylized facts in all of uh, the sociology of education uh, is that children um, from higher income families do better in school. They perform better on uh, uh, academic tests. They are more likely to go to college. They're more likely to go to selective college. They're more likely to get an advanced degree. They, in any uh, sort of educational measure, children from higher income families tend to do more. Now, that's been true since the, you know, the Coleman report. It was true long before the Coleman report, but um, certainly it was you know, true when, when Coleman studied the issue. But the, the strength of that relationship, how well income, family income predicts educational success, is not a fixed thing. So it might vary um, across time, it might vary across societies, it might vary sort of in, in relation to uh, features of education policy or social policy or economic conditions. And so I want to sort of think uh, a, a bit about that today. So the big questions 
that you might sort of keep in the back of your mind is what role does schooling play in, in uh, socioeconomic inequalities and social reproduction, social mobility? That is, is schooling uh, help us understand the extent to which people from uh, low income backgrounds uh, have high social mobility, can move upward in the sort of economic ladder? Under what conditions does schooling do that? And to what extent does broad social inequality play a role in this? Um, and there's sort of, in some ways, this sort of question that people like to ask all the time about education. That is, is education sort of equality producing or, or inequality producing? Does it, does it make things more or less unequal? Or, or does it not play a role at all? Is it just sort of economic conditions that matter? I'm not going to be able to answer all of those questions, really any of those questions today. But, I, but they're, they're good questions still. Um, I'm going to sort of give you some, some answers to some smaller questions that are going to help think about that, I think. So one is, how big are socioeconomic inequalities in educational outcome? How big are they now? How have they changed over the last several decades? Um, and that's going to sort of help present some sort of stylized descriptive facts to sort of think about the relationship that might uh, exist between income inequality and education. And then I'm going to look at some international evidence and a kind of uh, 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 some preliminary work um, uh, that looks at across countries, what features of, uh, of countries or economic conditions in countries are related with more or less uh, educational inequality. So how much does economic income inequality matter in a country in producing uh, educational inequality and, and why? So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, three different things. So we already did the introduction, so we're moving on here. I'm going to first tell you about income uh, and educational outcomes in the US based on a couple different studies. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, this cross-national work that looks at income and inequality and education outcomes in, in OECD countries, developed countries. And then I'm going to sort of end by sort of discussing some reasons why we might see the patterns uh, we see. So first, let's, let's look at what income inequality looks like in the US. So this is a, a now famous graph uh, by uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez. Um, and this, this sort of charts the development of income inequality in the US over the last 90-something years. So the, the red line tells you the percentage of all income earned in the US that went to the top 10% of earners. Um, back in 1929, before the stock market crashed, and, uh, and, and up through really 1940, through the start of World War I, economic inequality was really high in the US. The top 10% of earners earned more than 45% of all the income. That plummeted after World War II, a result of dramatic changes in the economy, uh, the, the rapid economic growth of the 50s and 60s. And so through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, economic inequality was low. It wasn't zero. We, you know, the top 10% of earners earned about a third of all income in the US. And you can see that it took off dramatically in the last 30 years or so. Um, and now the top earners earn uh, nearly 50% of all income in the US. So economic inequality now is as high or higher than it's ever been in the last century. So we might wonder what, what are the consequences for, for that big upward trend there for educational outcomes. Here's another way to look at income inequality that's going to be uh, useful later on. So this, instead of saying how much, uh, what share of income do the top earners have, this looks at the ratio of the income of a, of a family at the 90th percentile of the income distribution to the income of a family uh, at the 10th percentile of the income distribution. So back in 1970, that, that high earning 90th percentile family earned about five times more than the 10th percentile family. And uh, now that's about 11 times difference. So the sort of gap in income between the bottom and top of the income distribution is more than twice as high as it used to be. Um, in, in sort of today's dollars, the 90th percentile family now, this is the 90th percentile family with children, earns somewhere around $170,000, $165,000. Um, and the 10th percentile family earns something like $16,000, rough, roughly. So, so uh, that's that 11 to 1 gap. Um, now, if we look, if we break this down a little bit, Instead of looking at the ratio of the 90th to the 10th percentile family, this is the ratio in the, the blue line here of the, 90th, of the 50th to the 10th percentile family, and this is the ratio of the 90th to the 50th. So now we're sort of, the blue line's comparing family at the median to the family at the bottom, 
and the red line's comparing the family at the top to the family at the middle. And you can see that all the growth, most, most of the growth in the 70s and 80s in this uh, in measure of income inequality was because the middle pulled away from the bottom or the bottom fell out. But, but the difference between being at the uh, sort of middle class, median income, and being at the 10th percentile got a lot bigger over that time period. And then has been pretty flat since then. And the income ratio of the 90th to 50th percentile has sort of slowly and steadily increased over this whole time period. Keep this in mind because we're going to, because there's going to be a quiz later. Because uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to come back and re refer to this um, a, a little bit later. But the important thing here is that although income inequality by lots of measures grew at the top, when we look at children with, at families with children, a lot of the growth in income inequality over the last 40 years uh, happened between the middle and the bottom. And that's, that's important to think about the, uh, later on uh, when we get there. So hold that in your mind. Now, let's look at the, the gap in, in achievement in standardized test scores between children at the high and the, and the bottom end of the income distribution. So what I'm going to do to look at this is I, I took all, all data, set I, data I could find for the last 50 years that included nationally representative samples of, of students, standardized test scores, um, and information on family income. So there's 13 big nationally representative studies I found. They go back. The, the first one is Project Talent. It was 1960. They tested 400,000 high school students. Um, and the most recent one uh, is this, uh, ECLSB, this early childhood cohort, these children born in 2001 who were tested when they were in kindergarten in 2006, 2007. And so about 50 years of data, cohorts of children born as early as the early 1940s and as recently as 2001. And we're going to look at each of those cohorts of kids and, and look at the relationship between their family income and their test scores. So here's, here's sort of how we do it. This is one, one sample. Uh, so we line up everyone by their income, their rank in the income distribution. So it, this is data from 1988. Um, these were eighth graders in 1988. So in 1988, if your family made between 15 and $20,000, if you were between the 20th and 30th percentile or so of the income distribution, and you had uh, average test scores that were about here. These are sort of standardized test scores. And so we, we plot all these scores and we look at this nice red line I drew th through here. And I'm going to take the average test score at the 10th percentile, so 10th percentile kid right here, and I'm going to take the average test score at the 90th percentile, and I'm going to take the difference in those average scores, and that's going to be the 90-10 the income achievement gap. It's the average difference in test scores between a child whose family makes at the 90th percentile of income and the fam child whose family makes at the 10th percentile of income. So it's sort of analogous to those 90-10 income gaps, but now it's, um, it's a, a, a test score. And so for every one of these studies, we're going to sort of do the same exercise and, and compute this gap. So here we would say the gap is uh, three quarters of a standard deviation, 0.37 minus negative 0.38. So about three quarters of a standard deviation test score gap. Um, Here's another example. This is from 2006 eighth graders. Same, same story. We draw the picture, and you can see the gap is a lot bigger. Now it's almost 1.2 standard deviations. So I'm going to do, th do that for every one of these studies. I won't show you the picture for every one of the studies, but that's the basic idea of how we, we compute this. And when I put all the studies together, I get this lovely picture. So uh, on, the, on the bottom here, we have the birth year of the cohort. So the earliest study has children born in the 1940s, most recent in 2001. And then for each of those cohorts, I get an estimate of the gap. That's what the dot is. And then, and then these standard error bars are just sort of uh, our confidence intervals around it. And then we fit this curve through it. And the, the story here is the, the achievement gap is relatively flat through the, for cohorts born in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s and then starts to widen in the mid-70s through 2000. These data are somewhat unreliable, so I don't put a lot of stock in this early rise because it's a, it's a very old test and we don't have too much information about it. But 
But the rest of it is, is uh, pretty credible tests. So this is uh, the gap in reading. We, we do it for math, and the picture's the same, but I didn't want to show you the same picture twice, basically. Um, but here's that same picture, but I took away all that extraneous dots. But, so this is the sort of story about the income achievement gap. It's gone from about uh, 0.8 or 0.9 standard deviations in night, for cohorts born in 1970 to about one and a quarter standard deviations for cohorts born more recently. So that's an increase of mm, roughly 40%. So that's, that's quite sizable. How big is that? How big is that in sort of <coughs> terms in com comparison to other things? Here's the black-white achievement gap over this same time period. So for kids born in the 50s and 60s, the black-white achievement gap was much bigger than the achievement gap between high and low-income children. But the black-white gap went down a lot. We made enormous progress closing the black-white gap over the several decades uh, uh, of kids born in the, in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. That progress has largely stalled. But at the same time that that progress stalled, the income gap has gotten much bigger. So now this income gap is um, you know, more than 50% larger than the black-white gap, which is sort of the opposite of the story here. In some ways, you could look at that picture and read the history of late 20th century America as we went from a society in the 1950s and 60s characterized by historically low levels of income inequality and very, very high levels of racial inequality in every sort of domain of life, whether it was education or health or mortality or, or what, what uh, income. Um, so in, we went from that era where sort of racial inequality dominates economic inequality in some ways to an era now where racial inequality is certainly not zero, these gaps are far from zero, and racial gaps are not zero in many other domains of life, but they're much smaller than, than they have been, and they're, they're at historic lows in many domains. But we're also in an era where economic inequality is at historic highs. So we've gone from this sort of era when racial inequality was in some ways more uh, extreme than economic inequality to an era where economic inequality is more extreme in some domains than racial inequality. Don't get me wrong, racial inequality hasn't gone away. Some people think I'm saying that. I'm certainly not saying that. And, you know, when this gets to zero, then I'll talk to you about racial inequality going away. But you, know, you can see we're still a long way from that. But economic inequality has become increasingly important. And if you look at this picture and you think about those earlier pictures, you might think, well, economic inequality, that is, income inequality went up at the same time the sort of achievement inequality went up. Are they related? Well, they have the same shape, so that's you know, sort of a start. But part of what I want to talk about for much of the rest of this is how much rising income inequality explains this, this rising uh, achievement gap. So let's go back to this. Now, we're going to divide this 90-10 uh, achievement gap into two halves, one which is the 90-50 achievement gap and one which is the 50-10. That is, the red part of this is the difference in achievement between the 90th percentile income child and the median income child. And the blue is the difference between the median income child and the 10th percentile income child. And the story here is that the gap between the child from the median income family and the low income family hasn't really changed over this time. If, if anything, it got a little bit smaller. But the gap between the 90th percentile family and the 50th percentile family child is where all the increase grew. This gap is about almost twice what it was uh, back here in, for kids born in the 70s or 60s. So most of the growth, in fact, all of the growth uh, is in this income achievement gap is really driven by children of high income families pulling away from middle class children, not from middle class children pulling away from low income children or low income children sort of falling further and further behind. If you look at test scores over the last 40 years, on average, test scores in math, for example, have gone up very dramatically in the US over the last 40 years. You might not know it if you listen to all the rhetoric about how terrible our schools are, but the average nine-year-old nine now has test scores equal to the average 11-year-old in 1978. That is we, sort of two years of progress over the last 30, 35 years. And if you look at the test scores of, of uh, low-income children, they've also gone up, but not as much. And if you look at test scores of high-income children, 
they've gone up dramatically. So, so this widening gap isn't driven by the sort of bottom falling out of the test score distribution or low income students sort of falling off the map. It's really because everyone's been going up, but the scores of high income children have been going up much, much faster than the scores of middle class children. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is, well, what happens during school? Does the gap get bigger as children progress through school? So here's uh, data from two studies. One is the early childhood longitudinal study of kindergarten cohorts. So these are kindergartners who were, they were in kindergarten in 1998, and they were tested seven times over the next uh, nine years. Fall, spring of kindergarten, fall and spring of first grade, third grade, fifth grade, and eighth grade. And this is the gap between the 90th percentile income child in kindergarten and the 10th percentile child, and this is the gap between those children in eighth grade. You can see that the gap got a little bit bigger, but not appreciably. It was, it's huge when kids enter kindergarten. And these, these dots over here come from another study of a birth cohort who were tested in their, their kind of school readiness at age four and then tested when they were in kindergarten. Um, and you can see even at age four, the gap is, is quite big on these school readiness measures that measure kind of pre-literacy skills. You know. So it doesn't look like the gap is sort of growing during the K-12 schooling years. The gap is really big uh, at the time kids enter kindergarten and even, even a year or two before. So this suggests that maybe schools aren't the reason why this gap is growing because if schools were the reason, if it's kids come to school and then high income kids get access to really good schools and good teachers and learn a lot and lower income kids get access to less good schools and don't learn as much, we would expect to see this gap widening during the K-12 years, but it doesn't. If anything, there's a little bit of evidence that it actually narrows in schooling because these, in, from fall to spring, the gap gets smaller while kids are in kindergarten, and then it grows a bit over the summer, and then from fall to spring, first grade, it narrows again. Now, we don't have any other fall to spring measures here that we can do this with to see if it continues. There's some evidence from some other more local studies, a Baltimore study, uh, that suggests that pattern sort of continues, but they're sort of small samples, so we don't really know if that's true. But if any, if, you know, I don't, I don't think you should read too much into this. You shouldn't walk away saying, schools narrow the achievement gap, and then summer widens it, and that's the, that's the story. But it does, it, there's nothing here to make you say, well, schools are really the culprit. Schools are widening it. Um, now, how much of the gap here is, is between the high and the middle, and how much is between the middle and the, and the low. Here's the same data, but now I broke it down again into this 90-50 and 50-10 gap. And you can see it doesn't change a whole lot. About a little more than half of the gap is between the bottom and the middle, and a, the rest is between the middle and the top of the income distribution. And that's pretty steady over time, uh, at least you know after kids enter kindergarten. So there's no... Um, there's no evidence that the, the sort of uh, gap is being disproportionately widened or narrowed at one part of the income distribution or the other uh, during the schooling years. Here's data from a bunch of other stu longitudinal studies just to show you that it's not unique to that study. So the blue uh, solid line is the one I showed you before, the reading from the ECLSK. But there's a bunch of these longitudinal studies with national samples that are followed over time and generally all of them show the gaps kind of relatively flat over the period of time, you know, the uh, age period that students are observed. This is the only one uh, that's different, and we don't really believe, this is a kind of a really lousy test, this prospects test, so this is probably not, not to be trusted. Uh, um, but. Even so, there's just this sort of one data point that suggests gaps narrow during school. For the most part, all these longitudinal studies suggest no substantial widening of the gap during the, during the K-12 years. All right, so, so what you should be thinking about now is, okay, so over the last 30 years or so, the gap in achievement between high and low income kids has widened. Now let's look to see what's happened in terms of uh, access to, to college, um, enrollment in college, particularly uh, we did a small little study recently where we looked at 
enrollment in the most selective colleges and how that was related to, to family income. Um, so, oh, first uh, I have this slide from Martha Bailey and Sue Donarski right here. So, uh, Martha and Sue looked at college enrollment, and this is um, the, f the fraction of students who complete a four-year degree, I believe, right? Yes. Um, and so there's two cohorts. They looked at one cohort born in the mid-60s and one cohort born uh, in the early 80s. For, for this cohort, um, only about 5% of low quartile students completed college. That went up modestly to 9% by the later cohort. But for high-income kids, the fraction completing college went up much more in sort of percentage terms. And so there appears from this uh, evidence to be a sort of widening disparity between high and low-income kids in, in who's completing a four-year college. Um, then we looked at data from uh, a, a couple studies. This is from uh, uh, the high school class of 2004, the study known as uh, ELLS. And we looked at where students enrolled in, what type of college students enrolled in after, um, uh, after high school based on these Barron's rankings. So we, we assigned people to one of nine categories. They either weren't in high school, I mean, they either hadn't graduated from high school, two, this is two years after uh, they should have graduated. Uh, they have a high school degree, but they're not in college and haven't enrolled yet in college. They're, they enrolled in something less than a four-year college, a, some kind of community college typically, or they were enrolled um, in a four-year college of one of six selectivity rankings. So the ones are the most selective institutions, um, the, the Michigans, for example. Um, uh, and then, you know, down here, the sixes are the, uh, the least selective four-year institutions, typically broad access institution four-year colleges that don't have any admissions requirements. And so the blue is, is the uh, upper income quintile students. Um, yeah, they're not strictly quintiles, but um, families with incomes more than $75,000 in 2001. You can see there's this very steep gradient where uh, in the most selective colleges, you've got lots and lots of high income kids and, and very few low income kids. Um, you do see this interesting pattern in, uh, and you see this in other data too that, that the most selective colleges actually have more low income students in them than the next tier of colleges and that's um, most likely partly because they compete for those students. You know, um, colleges want diversity um, and the most elect sele selective colleges can attract the high achieving low income students. There just aren't that many of them uh, to go around. So we looked at this a different way and we looked at if, depending on your family income percentile, what's your probability of attending a highly selective college? And by highly selective college, we mean um, one of those top two categories. So about, about uh, four, or I forget, four percent or six percent of students are going to these most selective schools. So if you graduated in the class of 1982, your probability of going to one of those uh, most selective schools obviously uh, increases as your income goes up, but increases very sharply if you're at the end. So the, you know, the 90th percentile family has a much higher chance of, of having their child go to one of those colleges than even the 70th percentile family. So most of the action is up there. We look at this in 1992, and the probabilities uh, increased, and it and increased substantially, particularly at the high end. Now, I think you should be a little bit worried about overinterpreting this increase because one of the things about the 1992 cohort is they were born in the around 1974, which was kind of the, the low point of the baby bust. That is, there's, there's the baby boom, and you've got big cohorts born in the 50s and through the mid 60s, and then the, the cohorts get smaller and smaller and smaller. So by the mid 70s, you've got relatively sort of historically small cohorts. And so your odds of go, get, finding a seat in one of these colleges are greater just because there's fewer of you and, and uh, you know, the same number of seats or roughly the same number of seats. So part of the reason why these probabilities go up and go up everywhere is because the cohort is smaller. So uh, you want to keep that in mind. And then this is it in 2004. Um, where the cohort's more comparable to 82. And so I think the, the 2004 to 82 comparison is probably more valid than uh, you, you might want to ignore the 92. But, but 
what it suggests is that the relationship between income and your probability of going to one of these selective colleges appears to have risen particularly at the high end. Um, and so access to those selective colleges seems to depend much more on family income than it used to. Now, one of the obvious mechanisms by which it depends on that is your achievement, since achievement's a big part of what, you, um, what gets you into these schools and is becoming a more important part, according to your colleague Michael Bastedo there, as, as the income achievement goes up, gap goes up, so it's, we're, we would expect to see a greater increase in uh, the role of, uh, you know, in the relationship between income and, uh, and elite college access uh, as we do, right? So I think um, that's part of the same story. I don't, I don't think it's because income itself sort of independently buys you more access. It probably operates largely through the stronger relationship between income and achievement. So that's my kind of quick tour through some descriptive stuff that, about the relationship between family income and educational success in the US over the last 30 or 40 years. Now I want to tell you a, a little bit about this international comparison. So in the US, we just have this one time series. And in it, you see income inequality going up, and you see this income achievement gradient going up. And you think maybe they're related to each other, but maybe they're not. Um, so let's look at other countries and see if the income inequality in a country is related to the size of this income achievement gap. And so um, that's what I did. So this is uh, work that I've been doing with uh, Kate and Chemilewski, who's over here, who's a postdoc at Michigan State right now. Um, and uh, was a student at, at Stanford until this past year. And so Kate and I have been uh, working on this study. And so what we did was we looked at wealthy OECD countries. So there's uh, the US and 18 other uh, OECD countries that uh, we could have, we got data from the uh, PISA or PEARL study that had family income. Not all the countries in PISA gave the family survey that included family income measures, so we don't have the full sample of all the PISA countries. We just have the ones uh, that gave this survey. And in the US, the US didn't give the survey, but we have data from the same cohort of students uh, who we have information from the ECLSK, so it's a comparable cohort, comparable age. And so in each country, we're gonna compute these 90, 10 income achievement gaps, and we're gonna see how they relate to some basic features of the, of the countries. So we, for each country, we construct four different indices to kind of summarize what we think are some features of, of the countries that might be related to the size of the income achievement gap. So first is this sort of poverty inequality index. So we, we look at the level of income inequality in the country, the, the child poverty rate, how much income segregation there is between schools in the country, low, child, low birth weight uh, rate and teen childbearing rate. All of these factors are sort of highly correlated, and so we... We load them all together. The reason we have to make these indices is because we only have 19 countries and we don't have a lot of degrees of freedom to work with. So we're going to kind of lump stuff together in potentially displeasing ways, but it's, uh, it's sort of the best we can do uh, with the cross-national stuff. Then we have this social welfare index, which just says, how much does the country spend on uh, things that might particularly help low-income families, like public health spending, public spending on family benefits, uh, pre-primary school spending, things like that. So that's a kind of what we call the social welfare index. Then we have this parental support index, which is a measure of the kind of social policies in a country that might support uh, families, particularly families with young children, so maternal and paternal leave policies. Uh, 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 and then we have this educational differentiation index, the argument being in countries where you have lots of tracking and lots of sorting of students among schools or classes by, by, uh, by ability, um, you might expect there to be wider income achievement gaps if income is correlated with it, and so high income children are more likely tracked into uh, higher tracks or in a case like Germany into sort of separate schools that are academic tracks versus vo vocational tracks. And so we might see the, you know, that sort of differentiation of instruction might lead to wider um, uh, income achievement gaps. In contrast, if you have a country where sort of everyone gets the same curriculum, the same, the same instruction in the same sort of context, you might think there'd be less of an income achievement gap, gap because there's sort of less uh, possibility for sort of uh, differential school environments to create uh, larger disparities. So 
we're going to look at these four indices and how they relate to the size of the income achievement disparity in each country. First, here's the size of the income achievement disparities across the country. So there's three, three different data sources. The Pearls uh, study, which is fourth graders in each of these countries tested in 2001, and the two PISA 06 and 09 studies, which have 15-year-olds uh, tested. Um, these, are all, these are all reading tests. So the US here in red, you can see it tends to rank on the, on the high end of the size of the income achievement gap. And there's a lot of variation. Uh, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Netherlands, some of the Scandinavian countries have relatively small income achievement gaps. That is, the, there's not as much difference in the achievement of high and low income kids in those countries. Uh, US, Greece, uh, Germany, Portugal have, on, have larger ones. Um, so, you know, an, another case of US exceptionalism up there. So um, now here's the, here's the relationship between the size of the income achievement gap in each country and the, this poverty and inequality index, which is a sort of combination of income inequality, poverty rates, things like that. And we drew two lines, uh, the red one, which uses all the data, and the blue one takes the US out. The US is a big outlier here, so we sort of didn't want US to, to be driving it. But you can see we get basically the same relationship um, between income inequality and the achievement gap, whether US is in the, in the data or not. Uh, lots of the uh, Scandinavian, Northern European countries are down here with both low, income uh, low achievement gaps and low income inequality. Um, we also took all of them out thinking maybe Scandinavia is just different and you still get the same sort of a relationship there. So it doesn't seem to be driven by any particular country. Here's the, here's the relationship between the, our educational differentiation index and the achievement gap. So remember, uh, the differentiation sort of says, does kind of everyone get the same kind of schooling or, or are there tracks and separate kinds of schools or separate tracks within schools? And here um, we get a, an upward slope, though it's somewhat different depending on whether we keep the US in. The US is sort of unusual in that it's not very differentiated by our measure, which, which mostly looks at how early tracking happens and how much between school tracking and things there are. But, but it's still upward. Uh, and then we look, did some regression models. So now you should think of these as very descriptive models. We're not trying to make big causal claims here about whether if you changed inequality or changed educational differentiation, you'd, you'd narrow these gaps or something. But from a sort of descriptive point of view, um, when we put in all four of the indices together, the educational differentiation and the poverty inequality index are significant. So we get rid of these two. And then we break the poverty inequality one into sort of its component parts to see maybe if, is it driven more by income inequality or child poverty rates or school income segregation. And any one of those separately has the same size of effect. Together, they're all so collinear that they kind of just fight with each other and none of them are significant. So we sort of think this is the best model because it's not really any different of this. But basically the story is both income inequality and educational differentiation seem to be related to how big the income achievement gap is. Now, um, the income inequality one you might not think is surprising, but I, but I think the fact that th this big features of the educational system are related to the size of the gap might suggest that the educational system does play some role in, in the size of the uh, income achievement gap. That is, Countries that have more differentiated systems. So, you know, the extreme here, uh, Netherlands is kind of a, an outlier. But so think of Germany. In Germany, students are, are tracked into different kinds of schools at a young age, at age, what, 14 or younger, right? 10. So, uh, and they might go to the, the gymnasium, the, the more academic track, or the Hauptschule, the, you know, the, the more um, vocational track. And so they, that's very early tracking and very, uh, you know, uh, major tracking. It's not sort of you're in the same school, but, but you take a math class that's more advanced and a, you know, French class that's less advanced, right? It's not, it's, it's a very serious sort of structural tracking. So places like Germany that have that kind of big differentiation tend to have uh, bigger gaps, even net of income inequality. 
So again, I don't think you should think of this as causal, but it's suggestive, I think, that maybe the educational system does play some role uh, in, in the relationship between income and achievement. Uh, there's a lot of caveats to that. You know, it's only in 19 countries and we only have four variables and, you know, we didn't measure everything terribly well and, and so on. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's we, you know, uh, we're trying to see if we can improve a few things, but, it, but you know, it's hard to do in this cross-national stuff. All right, the last thing I want to sort of talk about is why is this, why is this happening? Why is income increasingly related to children's educational success? Um, and so, you know, we want to think about whether or not schooling produces this. And I think there's two contradictory kinds of evidence I gave you here. They're just both sort of suggestive. One is, in the US, the gap doesn't widen as kids progress through school. And so that suggests schooling is not a big part of it. But in the cross-national stuff, the size of the gap is related to these big features of the educational system that suggest maybe schooling is part of it. So I don't think it's, there's sort of a clear, obvious answer here um, in, in, as to whether schooling uh, plays, a, plays a big role or a minor role. Um, but so why is it? So one, uh, one answer is it's just income inequality in the US. Income inequality has risen. So th you know, if money matters for how well your child does in school, and if the difference in the amount of money between the high and the low income families got bigger, then high income families have a lot more money. Money matters. Therefore, the difference in achievements is going to be better. Or it could be because income has gotten more strongly associated uh, with achievement than it used to be. So that a sort of a dollar of income matters more or is more strongly associated with achievement than it used to be. If that's the case, why? So let me do a little bit of math for you. So if we assume that, that your achievement is related to your, law, your income, uh, and the coefficient beta tells us how much the sort of doubling of your income relates to an increase in your achievement in a descriptive sense, then we can sort of take the average achievement of the 90th percentile minus the average achievement at the 10th percentile, and we can write it out like this, and we know the rules of logarithms mean we can divide this. And this 90-10, this is the 90-10 income ratio. This is the thing I showed you before that went up in the US. And so the gap between the 90th and 10th percentile family depends both on what beta is, and it depends on the income ratio. And so the gap could get bigger because the income ratio got bigger, and we know that happened. But it could also get bigger because beta changed. And so what we want to think about is, is it all because the, the income ratio got bigger, or did beta change? Did, does income sort of matter more or uh, in some ways than it, than it used to? Um, and so think of the first thing as a mechanical thing. Income matters a certain amount. Rich families have more of it than they used to relative to poor families, so their kids do that much better. That's sort of a mechanical relationship where beta doesn't change. And the other is this sort of contextual story where um, beta change, um, that is, as income inequality grows, maybe for some reason the association between income and achievement gets bigger. So, not, so we want to think about why beta might change. So here's the picture I showed you before. Remember, this is the 50-10 ratio, and it's going up a lot in the early period, and then flat, and this is the 90-50 ratio. If, if it beta stays the same, and if we look at our 90-50 income gap, it ought to kind of go slowly up. And our 50-10 income achievement gap ought to kind of go up a lot and then flatten out, right? If it's all driven by the changes in the income ratio. So what I did was I estimated beta from each of those studies, and then we're going to just look and see if beta stayed the same. But I'm going to show you two betas. One is the beta for the 90-50 uh, part of the data. So I, I just take the top half of the income data and I estimate beta. So how much does a, an extra amount of income matter among high income families? And then I'm going to take the bottom half of the data and estimate the bottom, how much does extra income matter among low income families? So here's the, this is the coefficient beta. It's how much your uh, difference in achievement with a doubling of income over time. 
And this is for the above median income families. So this is the high income beta. So it's gotten a lot bigger over time. Even if we ignore this, it's gotten bigger over time when we, when we fit this curve. And when we look at the low income beta, it's actually looks like it's gone down over time. So what this says is that the reason why the income gap, the income achievement gap has gotten bigger at the high end isn't just because the income diff ratio has gotten bigger at the high end, but because income some so sort of matters more at the high end. That is, families with twice as much income as other families in the top half of the distribution are, are seeing a lot bigger uh, difference in their children's achievement than they used to. So why would, beta, why would that beta be bigger there? And the sort of opposite story is at the bottom, that um, income matters, if anything, sort of less than it did at the bottom. I'm going to skip that. So uh, what else has changed that might help explain this, that why beta would change? Well, this is family expenditures on children over the last 40 years. And you can see that high income families spending on children has increased substantially over this period. Low income families spending hasn't increased much. So high income families appear to be, not only do they have more money, but they appear to be spending more of it um, on their children than they used to. So that might be part of it. It might be different patterns of investment. I'm going to skip that for a second. Uh, another possibility is that parents think about what they're supposed to do as parents differently than they used to, and, they, and it differs um, with, with social class. So um, there's this argument that uh, Annette Leroux makes that middle class families think of parenting as a process of what she calls concerted cultivation. So your children are orchids. You, you cultivate them, they're very, they're delicate, and, but they'll bloom beautifully, but it takes a lot of work and attention. You, you hover over them and water them from a teardrop or, you know, eyedropper or something. Uh, tear, maybe a teardrop, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, she, she says that's sort of the modern middle class version of parenting. And the working class version of parenting is what she calls the accomplishment of natural growth. You think of your parents like uh, your parents. You think of your children like you think of trees. They grow, but you don't spend a lot of time watering them and nurturing them, right? The, it rains, the sun comes out, the trees grow. That's what children do. They grow, they develop. You don't, you don't sort of have to make it happen through your uh, hovering kind of attention. Um, now, that may be a kind of relatively recent pattern. Um, uh, and there's some argument, Julia Wrigley and Mimi Schaub, that the parents have gotten sort of increasingly focused on cognitive development over the last um, uh, half of the, uh, the century, partly because schools have told them that's what they should focus on. That is, schools have said test scores and are important, and so parents have sort of focused on that. Schools have said going to college is important, and so parents have started to worry about it more and more. But that's differentially affected the sort of middle class. So as sort of evidence of this, there's this nice study by Julia Wrigley. It's, a, it's old, so it'd be nice to sort of see what the, the new data would look like. But she, she looked at magazine articles aimed at mothers uh, over the course of the 20th century. She, her graduate students did this, let's be honest, right? <laughs> um, thousands, thousands of articles over the, over the 20th century. And they looked at articles like this, these are magazines like Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, whatever the equivalents of those would be at sort of different uh, historical eras. And they looked at articles aimed at giving advice to mothers about what they should do with their young children. So a lot of these would be written by, by doctors or experts, and, and what, would they, what would they say? And so she categorizes the advice into five categories. So some, you know, they need nutrition, uh, medical attention, fresh air, um, Apparently, there's no more fresh air, you can see. <laughs> it, was, it was big in the 20s. Um, uh, intellectual stimulation and social emotional development. But you can see the early part of the 20th century, the advice is all about nutrition and medical care. Ma make sure they're healthy and they stay alive. Infant mortality was not trivial in the beginning of the 20th century, so that's not unreasonable advice to give to new parents. Um, but by the 50s and 60s, Cognitive and um, social-emotional development start to dominate, and so if 
if this sort of is a leading indicator or an indicator of sort of what parents do, and particularly sort of middle class parents who might be uh, reading these kinds of magazines, then it suggests that there's been this sort of shift over time towards an increasing view of what you're supposed to do as a parent to be about um, nurturing your child's cognitive and emotional uh, development. And if middle class families are doing more of that over time than working class families, that is if this is more a sort of change in, in the upper income or middle class families, then this could lead to more sort of investment in early childhood, more attention to how well kids do in school, uh, and all the sort of things that go into it. So, there, so it might not be so much that, that money is changing, but that parenting behaviors are changing in ways that are sort of correlated with income that might be driving this. Um, there's another argument that says it's not money, it's things correlated with money, but this is more what I think of as the sort of Sarah McClanahan argument, that is that family income, family structure has gotten really polarized over the last 40 years, and so family income is much more correlated with other stuff that might matter for kids' development than it used to be. So increasingly we live in a society where there's really just two kinds of families. There's the family with uh, two earners, both well-educated, um, Either, you know, one's employed or both are employed, have high income, the mother had her first child when she was relatively old, you know, meaning, uh, you know, mid-20s or, or later. Um, so that family has a lot of income, but it also has a lot of human capital, it has two educated parents um, and whatnot. Or you have families of single moms who are uh, less educated, unemployed or underemployed, and had their first child when they were, when they were quite young. And so, so that's a low-income family, but it's also a family with relatively low levels of education and human capital. And so it might be that this polarization of family structure that Sarah McClanahan writes about um, means that income gets more correlated with other features of the family that matter. So there's also this increase in, uh, in uh, what Schwartz and Mayer call assortative mating. You might know it as marital homophily. Whatever you call it, most of you are probably doing it. It means... It means you hang out with people who are like you. That is, you marry people and you have children with people who have similar levels of, of education as you do. And so as that's increased, it means that, that uh, a high-income dad increasingly has a well-educated high-income mom in the household too. And so income is, gets increasingly correlated with um, these other sort of human capital things in the family. And so it might, again, it's a story that says it might not be income, but this increasing correlation of stuff with income that, that matters for young children. Um, we did these models where this is using all of our data again, and we looked at the, we did regression models where we, we just predict your test scores on the basis of family income and parents' education. Really simple descriptive models, don't read too much into these things. But it's the income coefficient that gets much bigger over time, not the education coefficient. And so um, this, this suggests to us that it's not that sort of education is starting to matter more, but it's that income is mattering even net, mattering more even net of, of sort of its increase in correlation with, with parents' income. So that suggests maybe the McClanahan story isn't the dominant story. Um, so another possible story is residential segregation. So not only do rich families have more money than they used to, but they live near richer people than they used to. So um, uh, Kendra Bischoff and I uh, did uh, these studies recently, and, and there's others by uh, Tara Watson and Paul Jargowski that look at similar things, showing that income segregation rose a lot over the last 40 years. So this is uh, stuff Kendra and I did. So we classify neighborhoods into sort of six types, you know, it's affluent, near affluent, uh, middle, high middle, low middle, uh, low income and poor, and we look at how many families live in these different neighbor types of neighborhoods over time, and you can see, you know, there's an increasingly move of families either living in very poor neighborhoods or very affluent neighborhoods, and fewer and fewer families live in these kind of middle income, mixed in kinds of neighborhoods. There's lots of other ways to look at this, but all the data tells the same story. Income segregation has gone up. So if you think neighborhoods matter or schools matter for kids, well, high income families increasingly live in places where they have access to, to high-income neighbors and collective investment in sorts of things like 
high quality preschools and parks and schools and all, all the sort of things that go with uh, an affluent community that might play a role. Now, the neighborhood effects research has not been overly convincing on this point in terms of sort of saying that neighborhoods really matter. So, so I'm not saying this is the story, but it's certainly income has not just gotten more correlated with other stuff in the family, but it's gotten more correlated with other stuff in the environment. So high income kids live in much more affluent environments than they used to, and low income kids live in more low income environments than they used to. Uh, and they also therefore sort of goes to, go to schools that are more segregated, which, which then could add into this. So uh, my job here is, to, is really to tell you a bunch of possible explanations for this, but never to settle on any one of them. Uh, so you can all go do some research and tell us what the answer is. Um, so uh, it seems like um, inequality alone doesn't explain the widening uh, achievement gaps because the, the coefficients have gotten bigger. Um, and, and so why is it? So here's my sort of provisional story. I'm not saying this is right. This is how I'm thinking about it sort of today. Uh, and for the last few weeks, so it's not, it's not totally off the cuff. Um, so a couple of things have been happening. So for young workers, the returns to a college degree have uh, doubled or, or gone up even more, depending who you believe on this, um, at least the observed returns. It's, there's a contentious literature about this. But, but people have the story in their head that college has gotten more and more important. Um, uh, in terms of success in the labor market and, and upward social mobility. And so as people start to sort of think about education as being increasingly important, parental behavior and parental investment in their children changes. It changes how parents think about their children. It changes how, what parents um, do with their children, how, how they spend their money. Um, uh, and it also changes how they think about the role of schools. I think if you went back 40 years, you wouldn't find nearly as many people talking about whether schools are good at producing test scores, which is largely the conversation we have today. Um, the, the, in fact, it, it's kind of striking how much nothing else about sort of what schools are supposed to do as part of the national kind of policy conversation about schooling. We really talk about schools now as places that produce test scores in children. And if that's the message you're getting as a parent, that's kind of convenient because test scores are at least a thing you could observe and see if your kids are doing better on. If, if they're good at producing democratic citizens, it's not very easy to tell whether or not your school's doing that or whether your children is doing that or something. So as, as we sort of move towards this idea that schooling is more important, and we move to this idea that schools are really about test scores, then the natural and reasonable parental response is to try to do what you can to make sure your kid does well in school, which means getting good test scores. And so you, you invest your time and your energy and the money that you have uh, in trying to make sure your kid does well on test scores. Well, as income inequality grows, um, there's increased, I mean, as this grows, there's sort of increased competition for sort of educational success. If you think of educational as a positional good, that is, it doesn't really matter how much you know, it matters where you rank. Right? It's, you, want, you kind of want to be up at the top of that distribution, wherever the distribution is. Then you, then you sort of compete for position in that. And then as income inequality goes, grows, some families have a lot more money, essentially, to buy, to buy the things that help their children compete well in that. And so it's not that income inequality on its own drives this. It's that in an era of growing competition for educational success, widening economic inequality facilitates the success of the people at the very top of that and makes the sort of uh, the competition sort of that much more brutal and, and uh, harder to succeed at if you're sort of not at the, at the high end of the income distribution. So I think the big worry here is that as the link between income, the link between your family's income and your child's achievement grows and the link between the increasing uh, returns to, to um, cognitive skills and earnings, you get this feedback cycle where the children of the rich do well in school and those who do well in school get rich. And so, so the sort of idea of the American dream of sort of social mobility that if you just work hard and do well, you sort of rise up, gets harder and harder to achieve. Um, and studies of, of sort of social and economic mobility in the U.S. suggest that, that 
that's true, that we're, getting, we're sort of seeing less and less upward uh, social and economic mobility. And so, so I think this is all consistent with that story uh, of this kind of uh, increasingly sort of rigid uh, stratification uh, in the relationship between income and achievement. Now, and I don't think it operates primarily through schools, but schools certainly could be a mechanism for trying to sort of uh, buffer against that um, if, if designed well, if the system were designed well. But, um, but probably hoping that schools alone can sort of solve this problem is hoping for too much. I mean, uh, uh, when income inequality has gone up as fast as it has, it's unlikely to think that a single social institution like schools can, uh, can undo that and that it's, you know, we probably need more uh, redistributive, if I'm allowed to say that word, um, uh, <laughs> economic policies and, and whatnot. So I think I'm gonna, um, I think I'll stop there so we have time for questions, I think, right? Are we good on time? You wanna call on people or you want me to? Uh, either one, I'll call. This guy over here in green. Since we're taping, we're gonna have you ask in the mic. Uh, hello, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my question is in regards to self-learning and um, kind of like self-schooling. I was curious as to your opinion of um, what the role of that, of uh, inducing a passion to learn within students and um, empowering students to learn on their own will kind of be able to reverse the feedback cycle that you alluded to and how that plays into the education reform, um, do you think it's effective? Um, so I think all children probably have a natural desire to learn, but I suspect most children don't have a natural desire to learn in school um, <laughs> uh, or, or to do homework or, you know, that, that schooling is not the institutional arrangement that most children would organize for themselves if left to their own devices, um, or most adults for that matter, so I, I don't know why we do it. But um, So the trick, I think, is in, I mean, all schooling, no matter who it's for, you want, you want children to sort of uh, not lose that desire to, to keep learning and, and, and give them the skills that they can kind of keep learning on their own. The question is whether or not um, the schools that uh, serve lower income children are as good at doing that as schools that serve higher income children, or whether or not the econ economic conditions create the incentives that might make people want to do that. If, if it looks to you like no matter how hard you try, you're never going to get ahead because nobody around you gets ahead and, and schooling doesn't seem to have helped anyone around you, then it gets sort of hard to feel like it's really worthwhile to invest a great amount of energy in the, in the work of schooling, even if you like to learn. So, um, so I, I, I think in some ways we'd like all schools to probably to do more of that. Um, I'm not sure it's, it alone is the solution to the problem. I think, I think you need the mic. This may touch on the previous question. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not clear to me where you put the role of the school <clears throat> and of the neighborhood. And let me do it in a very specific example. Here in Ann Arbor, <clears throat> we have paired a couple of schools to increase the diversity within each. Um, we could save money on transportation by doing away with that pairing, thus have more money for instructional services and less diversity in each of those schools. Um, what should we be aware of or watching for as we make that choice? And then most strongly of all, do you just know what the right choice is based on your work? Um, no, I mean, I think in a, in a society where there's lots of residential segregation, which is 
the society we live in. You face this. If we had a society that wasn't so residentially segregated, everyone could, could go to school in their neighborhood with a diverse mix of students, and they could walk down a safe street to get there and come home and uh, you know, play in the sand lot, as they used to call it, uh, across the way, right? I mean, but, but given the amounts of residential segregation, you end up having to choose from, as a policy sort of perspective between kind of aiming for diversity but spending money on transportation or something, or you know, aiming for segregation, not aiming for it, but you know, accepting segregation and spending money on other things. So there's, there's a choice. In the long run, we ought to think much harder about housing policy. But in the short run, we, that's not going to solve the problem. So I think it also depends on the extent to which you think the goal of schooling is to sort of um, uh, as a, it depends whether you think, if you think of sort of schooling as a consumer good that parents are buying, then, then parents sort of want, they want their kid to go to school in their neighborhood with the peers that they paid to live next to and things like that. If you think that the role of schooling is partly to create sort of citizens who are able to participate in a diverse democracy, then you sort of think about there's a role to sort of make sure that children experience diverse environments and, and learn to function well in them, uh, even if that's not the first choice of every parent. But that's a, that's a harder sell in today's environment where we think of schooling as a kind of consumer good that parents sort of are buying for their kid in a sort of individualistic way. There is, I think, um, some interesting research on the benefits of diversity, some of it done by Scott Page here at University of Michigan. There's an interesting study I was talking to someone about today by Heather Schwartz that children in low-income families in, in Maryland were randomly assigned to live in different uh, low-income or mixed-income housing projects, depending on sort of availability and whatnot. And, um, and the families that were assigned to uh, housing units where the child would go to a, a more diverse or middle-class school, the children in those schools saw much better long-term outcomes than children who were assigned to go to schools that were more homogeneously low-income. And so it's a nice study because it has this sort of random assignment experiment nature and suggests that uh, going to a more socioeconomically diverse school was, was beneficial e even in terms of test scores uh, for the low-income children. Now, there aren't enough of those studies that we can say convincingly that, that that's a consistent thing. Um, and there are other studies which su would suggest that peer context and stuff doesn't matter. So I don't think it's a, a sort of settled question from a kind of empirical scientific point of view whether or not diversity has benefits in terms of um, academic achievement. But I think we also ought to bring into the conversation the issue of whether we think diversity has benefits for other things we value in a democracy uh, other than academic achievement. And, and in some ways, I think framing the conversation that way makes it easier to have, to, to think sort of thoughtfully about the trade-offs you raise rather than to, to sort of um, uh, end up sort of with everyone fighting for, you know, the thing that's best for their kid without thinking about the sort of collective good. Uh, who's got microphone? You and then some of your people in the back next. Yeah. Um, Finland, uh, Finland, um, like in the past 20 years or so, like really overhauled their schools and essentially focused on equality in public schools. And like along with that, they made private schools pretty much non-existent. Do you think that something like that could work in the United States? Um, so uh, there's almost as many explanations for why Finland scores as well as it does as, as there are Finns. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I mean, uh, there's a lot of ways Finland's different than the US. And so I, I don't know what it is that makes it different. There's certainly things like you point out, also things about how they train the teachers, how much they pay teachers. There's a, there's a bunch of big structural features about Finland. Uh, is educational system, not to mention Finland as a, as a society. So I don't know why. But would getting rid of private schools work in the US? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's doable. in the. First place, I mean, we have this sort of um, long tradition of 
private schooling, and sort of two traditions of it. One, a kind of uh, religious reason that you'd have all sorts of fights about if you tried to not allow there to be private religious schools. And then a kind of elite opt-out private system that is, you know, I, I'm willing to pay $40,000 a year for my child to go to a, what I think is a better school than a local public school. And, um, and I think you'd have a hard time disallowing that somehow. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's feasible to get rid of private schooling in the US. Um, and I'm, it's not clear to me it would solve the problem, because I think you'd just find ways to re-stratify uh, within the public sector. Like one thing in higher education, um, as, as big public institutions got more and more, um, got sort of bigger and bigger, and uh, in order to sort of compete, they just end up stratifying inside themselves. So almost every big state institution has an honors college inside of it so that they can essentially have a kind of small liberal arts private school experience for a select group of students inside the big public institution. American institutions are enormously nimble in finding ways to sort of stratify themselves under any uh, f form you give them. So I don't, it's not clear to me that getting rid of private schools, even if one could do it, would in the long run um, change things. There were some back here. Uh, I just had a question on the institution of the school itself. So I've heard, for example, 100 years ago, if someone would be transported through time to now, the only thing they'd really recognize in society is the, the school building. We still teach the same way. We have one person who teaches to a classroom. And so my question is looking at how the school could play a role, and I guess not as much how much of a role do they play, but instead of looking at the school itself and the way it's uh, the way we are taught now, what would you, or do you have any specific suggestions or alternatives that you yourself think could help specifically lower income students? For example, with the role of new technology, identifying that usually um, there's been evidence that shows that perhaps boys learn differently than girls. Things that um, we could do inside the school that instead of just change about the income, but the actual way we are taught. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, uh, other than kindergarten, schools really don't look any different probably than they did 100 years ago. So I think you know, all the new kind of excitement around technology um, and the possibilities of sort of online learning and flipped classrooms and whatever the sort of thing of the week is, are, I mean, are great, right? There's lots of potential there, um, uh, both in higher education and in K-12, but I think if I th what we need to do is sort of think carefully about how to organize those so that they're sort of equity producing, I think. Um, because to the extent that sort of some of the actors in the, in, and players in the market are, are interested in profit, um, they're, they're gonna have a very different agenda than a kind of social equity agenda potentially. And to the extent that there's just kind of a unregulated, let's just sort of see what happens, the people with the most say in society the, and the people with the most sort of voice and resources are often going to be the, the most advantaged. And so a lot of things end up tilting in, in ways that end up favoring the more advantaged, unless there's a kind of um, conscious discussion about how to make sure that things are sort of equity producing. So, um, so all I would say is I think we ought to really, we ought to be excited about all these kind of new possibilities that that the kind of new technological environment offers, but we ought to think about trying to make sure that we do them in ways that favor the more disadvantaged population rather than sort of tilt towards the more advantaged population. Uh, oh, you, you, you guys up there next? How much time do we have? I don't want to. Looks like about seven. Seven minutes. Okay. And then maybe over here next, if someone can take the microphone over there. 
Hi, one of the things that I thought was the most striking or one of the most striking things about your presentation was that it seemed like a lot of the gap in um, achievement by income existed prior to students even getting to kindergarten. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about why that may exist, particularly as it relates to maybe things that are happening in the home and how we could possibly address those things um, using public policy given that we don't get those students till, until they're actually in the education system. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, in terms of where we ought to invest limited money and limited energy, early childhood investments have got to be sort of number one from an educational perspective. Like getting, getting kids to school ready to learn and equally ready to learn, regardless of background, would do more to change all forms of inequality in society than anything else you can probably think of. I mean, I think we ought to think also about housing policy and, and segregation issues, but you know, if I had sort of one thing I was allowed to do. If I was elected president, I had four years, and I can only focus on one policy, and I'd already done health care. You know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I, would, I, would, I would invest big time in, in early childhood, and, and lots of different kinds of early child things. Things like the nurse family partnership that helps first-time low-income moms learn how to, how to be a parent and deal with all the stress and anxiety and unfamiliar, what am I supposed to do with this young person, kind of. Um, all, things like that have shown to have long-term impacts uh, for kids. Things like high-quality early childhood programs, child care, preschool, all that stuff pays off you know, the investment. You've got to think of it as an investment, not a, not a cost, right? It's because I think the payoffs would be enormous if we sort of invested substantially in early childhood stuff. We don't. We have a pretty uh, loose public involvement in the early childhood role, and I think that's why we see the gaps so as big as they are. Hi. I wonder about the difference in outcomes between the white, non-Hispanic white, traditional sort of population, and the black population, and the immigrant Hispanic Asian and so on population, because it seems to me that you know one of your conclusions is is about the negative feedback loop where the rich, the children of the rich get rich, you know do well in schooling and and the children of the poor do poorly in schooling, um, and therefore, you know you're not seeing the traditional social mobility, the American dream, but I think that that's still there for the children of immigrants, you know, who do a lot better by and large than their parents, unless their parents were professional immigrants, of which mm -hmm. there are plenty. And also the children now increasingly, of, there is a new and growing black middle class. Uh, so I wonder if the people who are actually stuck with that disappearing middle, it, if it's not more the traditional non-Hispanic white population that is experiencing that. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple of things are, uh, let me just, a few, data facts. So um, if we look at this story just for whites, if I showed you these pictures just for whites, it would look the same. Um, that is, the gap between the 90th percentile white and the 10th percentile white has gotten bigger by the same amount over this time period. It, if we look at it just for blacks, it, it also is the same, though it's harder to estimate because the samples are smaller, and it's hard to look at for Hispanics over this long time period. Um, so the, the kind of widening gap seems to be there, both within the black and the white population, and um, it's unclear about the Hispanic population. When you look at uh, the black-white achievement gap and the Hispanic-white achievement gap, that is, uh, when kids enter kindergarten, they're both quite big. In fact, they're, they're equally big. And, and economic disparities between uh, Latinos and whites are about the same size as economic disparities between blacks and whites. But something interesting happens. The Hispanic-white gap gets smaller in the first years of school, and the black-white gap gets bigger in the first few years of school. So even though they sort of, there are these sort of similar economic conditions in a very sort of crude sense, and the gaps are sort of the same when kids get to school, the trajectories once they're in school are, are quite different. And one obvious reason is that Latino students are acquiring English um, that part of the reason their gaps are big is their low, lower levels of English skills when they get to school and they acquire English and that helps them do better in school and, and do better on tests. Um, and, and also that potentially black students are actually in schools that are often pretty lousy and that's why the gap between blacks and whites is getting bigger. 
most of the research suggests that after you control for family income, the black-white gap is not zero, but is a lot smaller than it is now. There's a new paper by Jesse Rothstein where he uses sort of better measures of long-term family income, and he says once you do that, the black-white gap goes away. But that's the only paper to date that has really convincingly argued that income alone is enough to explain the black-white gap. Um, most, most other papers suggest income alone isn't enough. There's not sort of a comparable study of the relationship between income and the Latino white gap that I know of, so that would be an interesting area to, to look more at, I think. Do we have time for more? One short one. I think uh, there was somebody over here waiting. Uh, thanks. My question falls a little bit on that. Um, that particular graph we had the, the, the black white achievement gap reducing over the last half of the 20th century, the income achievement gap uh, increasing. I thought that was really interesting. I wondered if there was any conversation about looking at the public policies in that time frame that helped to reduce sort of the racial gap and whether or not those same types of policies but retargeted for income might have similar effects or no effects? Yeah, uh, good question. So what happened in, so these are kids uh, born between sort of 1955 and 75 for which the black-white gap uh, narrowed dramatically. What happened then? Well, there was the war on poverty, there was the Civil Rights Act, there was desegregation of schools in the South, there was desegregation of hospitals in the South. There was a whole bunch of social policy that was aimed at increasing, uh, at, at reducing um, uh, discrimination and disparities between blacks and whites, particularly in the South, but also, and most of that gap is, is from the South, over that time period. So it wasn't just that there was some education policy that tried to make uh, school serving black students better. It, uh, you know, desegregation of hospitals in the South had a huge impact on black infant mortality and, um, and, and black infant uh, morbidity, you know, disease and sickness, which has implications for later on achievement. Um, things like Head Start, uh, uh, the War on Poverty, all those things sort of helped the black population in lots of ways other than sort of directly educationally. And so, we would, you know, the, I guess the implication that would be, do we need some sort of, you know, wraparound targeted kind of uh, set of social policies if we wanted to see the sort of same size uh, of, a, of effect on the income achievement gap, I guess. And we're not really, that's not really part of the national conversation. We're kind of trying to take money away from them uh, and services away from them rather than, you know, invest more in them. On that lighthearted note, <laughs> uh, uh, help me thank uh, uh, Professor Rudy.